Welcome Summit Racing fans to our Facebook Live Friday session. Today we are joined by a great American <laughs> and he continues with our American success stories that we've highlighted throughout this year. So we've had Jay Leno, Ken Lingenfelder, Larry Nance, and now David Freiberger. So David, it's great to have you here. I'm gonna shamelessly read your bio that I stole from the Motor Trend website. Oh, this so, will be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I know our fans already know you, but I just want to highlight you've had an amazing career, and I just want to highlight these things. So David is the editor-in-chief of Hot Rod and Hot Rod Deluxe. He's never held a job that's not revolved around cars, starting with a position at a Dodge dealership parts counter immediately after high school, and then moving to a machine shop, then an aftermarket ignition company, and finally landing at Peterson Publishing in 1991 as a Hot Rod staff editor. At the publishing company, he's been editor of Four Wheel and Off-Road, Carcraft, Rod and Custom, and many one-time publications. Freiberger can often be seen on Hot Rod TV, heard on Hot Rod Live Radio, followed on road trips, and many episodes of Roadkill. He's a member of the Bonneville 200 Mile Per Hour Club, held many land speed records, and is renowned for owning far too many cars, numbering a couple dozen as of the writing of this thing that I stole. The most well-known is probably the F-bomb Camaro. In short, David is the real deal, and he does tie into the Summit Racing slogan that we are powered by enthusiasts. So David, welcome, and thank you for making the time with us today. It is really great to have you here, and it's great to see you. Thanks, you too. Thank you. So hey, can... first things first, before we get into car talk, so when I was researching your bio, I went down this rabbit hole, and the internet is terrible because it can take you down all these directions. So I go and start to type in David Freiberger and it says David Freiberger age. And I click on the link and that takes me to another link. It takes me to a forum. All these people are claiming that you are 73 years old. And I'm like, if he's 73, I'm going to eat and drink exactly what that guy's doing. So I need the recipe. So, so Cola David, every day, <laughs> Coke every day. All right, we're there. <laughs> so, you know, you're, you're living and breathing the high octane life. Are you 73? Let's get this out of the way and then we'll move on to the car stuff. This is such a freaky thing. It's become such a deal. I get asked that question on social media, zero exaggeration, every single day, often multiple times. And uh, there's a bunch of fan sites that say I'm 73 years old. I'm in fact 53 years old. And uh, people could really figure that out if they did the math on a lot of my posts about, you know, I bought my first car in April of 1983. I, mean, I wasn't you know, 60 when I did that. So, yeah, 53 awesome. years old. Well, you know, I was thinking there would be an opportunity for like a Summit branded David Freiberger nutritional supplement that'll keep you right. 20 years younger, but we're going to, we're going to skip that and we'll move on. I was thinking we were all around the same age, but just, just wanted to confirm that because man, that, uh, the, well, the stories that are out there are amazing. And even true personal friends of yours are on the internet saying you're 73. So Oh yeah, we, uh, I'm very tight with those people. <laughs> awesome, we appreciate that. So David, let's talk about your history. You know, I, I think your your rise to doing what you do now and your history is just awesome. And, it, and to me, for some of our younger audience, it ought to be really inspiring to say, you know, hey, you guys can do this. You can start working in a parts store, parts counter, go to work in a machine shop. You you can work with your hands. You can you can grow into this type of a role. And there's a lot of younger internet influencers who are really the same same thing, following their passion. They're doing what they love to do, and it's awesome. So how how'd you get here? When you back when you were a teenager and you loved cars like all of us did, did you ever think you'd get here? Did you ever look ahead and go, yeah, I'm going to be the uh, the roadkill guy someday? Oh, absolutely not. You know, I was collecting vintage magazines when I was 13 or 14 years old and just memorizing the stuff, all the different things, popular hot riding, car craft, hot rod, motor trend, everything. And of course, I never thought that I would be the guy actually producing those magazines. And at the time, car TV wasn't a thing at all. So of course, I had no aspirations to do anything like that. And honestly, the whole TV thing, it was an accident that we just fell into. No kidding, really. So you were, you were, where, when, where were you when that started? Was that at Hot Rod? Yeah. So here's how my biggest show, Roadkill, sort of came to be. Um, I was the editor of Hot Rod starting in 2001. And uh, 
at the time we were doing Hot Rod TV, as that ancient bio said, and that was the only real car TV show. It ended up becoming what we now know as Horsepower TV and on and on. So I did a little bit of that, but there came a time when the company, which was you know the publishing company that owns Motor Trend, Hot Rod, Car Craft, Four Wheel and Off-Road, all of these different titles, wanted to do video for their websites. And so me and my staff guy, Mike Finnegan, started doing videos just on the stuff that we were doing that was fun, road trips and things like that, junkyard rescues. And at the same time, YouTube came in and they were trying to compete with cable TV. And so they offered a number of channels money in order to produce original programming just for YouTube. So long story short, Roadkill became part of that. We became the largest automotive channel and show on YouTube. And through a series of events, we're now in a joint venture with Discovery, and we're doing all of our shows now on the Motor Trend app that people can subscribe to, and they also air on Motor Trend Cable TV. Excellent. That's Excellent. awesome. So I, I think about what you said there, you know, with you know the big stacks of magazine. I had boxes full of magazines going back to the 50s. And like you, I, like, I memorized those articles. I basically taught myself, you know, uh, how to build a car, how to build an engine, how to tune an engine out of these magazines, you know, and, and I think about all the writers, you know, that were there in the seventies and the eighties and the nineties, and those guys were my personal heroes. So for my personal transition into this industry, uh, it was through the engine building side. And then it was into the, like the parts production side, you know, the parts he put in a racing engine. So, yeah, it, it's, it's funny how those magazines, you really launched, you know, so many of us into this business. They really did. And now it's, you know, we all talk about the influencers. It's the uh, the so-called kids on YouTube and Instagram and social media and things like that. And you asked, like, how could I as a kid have predicted that I would get in the industry? And I couldn't. And I ended up becoming one of very few people who gets those jobs. Today, there's no barrier to entry. You can just make the content and put it out there and you can get fans. And there's a lot of people who have tons of followers, but the question is, where's the credibility? You know, there's so many people putting information out there that I think it's harder and harder to weed through what's accurate or what's not. But then the good news is that if you're involved in any little tiny niche, you can find somebody who is authoritative about that and you can get more information about that than you ever could if you were a subscriber to CarCraft that might do one Pontiac build up every two years. If you it, kind of go it, see where I'm going there. Yeah, I mean, I know exactly where you're going with this thing. Um, a good friend of ours, uh, Terry Coverman66, he got into doing LS swaps like really, really early back when nobody was doing it. And so for a lot of people, he became a reference. And then the more mm -hmm. people that started going to his channel, you know, the more people, you know, he started building up and being able to do it more full time just because he has more following. So yeah, it's, it's one thing to do one video or one thing to do a couple, you know, but those guys out there that are just doing the steady march, you know, you can tell. Yeah, I think the key thing, David, and I think you hit on it perfectly, is when you're gonna create content, building up the credibility by being accurate. So there's a ton of content on the internet and there's a lot of content that's awesome with people that create it that know their stuff and they're really intelligent, bright, smart people. But there are some folks that they kind of puddle their way through it and, uh, you know, they don't give you no. the most exact information. So you got to be a little bit cautious about following people. But the yeah. good thing is, like you said, with no barriers to entry, if you create great content and you're accurate, and you're genuine in what you're doing, you're gonna develop a following because people are gonna trust you and they're gonna come back to you. And uh, you know that's one of the reasons we try to hit on some of the key areas that customers have questions on and put out a lot of YouTube videos on different topics. I know in the past we've, we've partnered on different projects over the years. Your show Roadkill has been an awesome example of being brutally honest about stuff that goes well and Breakage. stuff that doesn't go well. <laughs> uh, like engine swaps in parking lots when it snows. So, uh, Which we did at a summit shop in Sparks, Nevada, right? Yes, absolutely you did. And our, I remember, I think our folks brought you out like a pop-up because they felt bad for you because you guys were getting snowed on and uh, just, yeah. uh, just a tough deal. Um, and not that you want to do an engine swap in a parking lot every week, but when you think back to Roadkill, what are some of your most memorable things that when you talk about creating content and things that get everybody really interested, super excited, and, and the episodes, even aside from that, the ones that are your favorites, what were the best moments in Roadkill? 
Um, really early on, I think we discovered that failure is winning for this type of content. And I think we also showed that reality shows that are bogus don't work in the face of reality shows that show you actually what happens in the real world. And that's what I mean by failure is winning. The very first episode we ever shot, we thought we were going to drive our ranchero all the way to Alaska, and it broke down a whole bunch of times on the road, and we didn't make it there, and we were going to ourselves, man, this is our very first episode. This is like the pilot. We can't put this out there and show how miserably we failed. So we shot another episode and posted that, and then this failed Alaska trip was the second episode, and that's the one that put us on the map because it showed real guys breaking down in real miserable situations. And uh, we realized you just got to tell it like it is. And we've gone from there. And that's what's been big for us. As far as my favorite episode ever, it's the one where we built the General Mayhem 68 Dodge Charger out of a old motor home and a Charger shell that I traded for a set of cylinder heads. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's a great one. Weirdly, like my first car, my first car truck was a 68 Ranchero. So when I actually saw you guys out there running that thing, I'm like, my God, there's still one in existence relatively rust free because we don't see them over here in the East anymore. You know, they're like the one vehicle that's old that you can still buy fairly affordably out here. For some reason, go to Craigslist and search Rancheros in LA. Yeah. You can still get them for 2,500 bucks. I don't know why. <laughs> I can tell you why, but anyway, <laughs> there has to be something, right? Cool. So David, Kyle Duffy had a question for you and I think it's great. So what's your next goal and why? Because, um, you know, your, your history, I think, with all the different things you've done is amazing. And Brian and I joke sometimes about having automotive ADD and how many interests you have and how many types of racing you want to do. And, and I think you're right there with us. I think we're going to have a support group, uh, you know, to talk about land speed racing and drag racing and off-road racing and all the, all the cool stuff that you like to do. Because we, we enjoy all that, too, and want to do all of it. But what's the next thing for you? What's your, what's your next goal? What do you want to do? So the type of racing I'm involved with that I've been actually successful at is land speed racing. I'm in six 200 mile an hour clubs, which means I've actually set records in excess of 200 miles an hour at six different venues. And most recently I did that at El Mirage Dry Lake here in California, which is hard packed dirt. It is literally a silt dry lake bed where they started racing in the thirties with hot rods. Like Ed Iskandarian has a timing plaque on his Model T from like 1938 from El Mirage Dry Lake. It's like where it all began. So I set a record there, actually beat an old Andy Granatelli record there last month. And we started looking at it and realized that we could go for the points championship at El Mirage this year, which means we need to set a record six times in a row at six meets. Wow. So this afternoon, I will be putting our car back on the chassis dyno and drag it up there on Saturday. And on Sunday, I'll be trying to set another record out there. So you do a lot of this work with Keith Turk, right? Correct. Keith and Tanya Turk own the Hot Rod Magazine special 1980 Camaro that we've raced since 2004. And our deal is they own the car and I manage the, the engine. Like flywheel forward is my problem. Flywheel back is their problem. And it's worked That's out really awesome. well. Keith is a, a personal hero of mine too, because I raced in the ECTA, set some records with my, uh, my vet back in 2011 and 12, and now continue to do that with Steve Strupp. Uh, he and I were out over in Arkansas a yeah. month ago with ECTA. That was awesome. Yeah. You know, and we just, we love the land speed because of the, the wide variety of cars that race out yeah. there, you know, the small engines, big engines, you know, and we talk about it, you know, gas, electric, steam, you know, diesel, <laughs> like whatever you can power these things. So it's like, you know, the sideshows are interesting, but then the types of eccentric people that put these things together. And I can say that because I are one. Yeah. You know, is, you know, that's, that's the best part about showing up to these land speed events. Yeah. I haven't done Arkansas. I need to get there for sure. Yeah, That'll be seven amazing. 200 mile an hour clubs if I can do that. Yeah, David, it's awesome. And, and, and Steve, as you know, I'm sure, you know, Steve, he is just, that group was the greatest group of people. We were a little worried going down there, taking it, taking an electric down there. So we're like, okay, what are, what are these folks going to think of it? Land speed people are awesome because our automotive ADD fit right in. It was just great. Yeah. When we're looking around there. We had a great interview we did with um, the fellas from the garage shop and they had, they redid the Aero Wars with a Daytona and a Talladega Torino on basically effectively their NASCAR chassis and NASCAR powertrains, but they went 225 in the Daytona, 226 in the Talladega. So it was awesome awesome seeing those guys there and it was just a fantastic time meeting them um jr gottlieb was there with big red i mean yeah 
you know, and then the young lady that we met who you interviewed, she was incredible. Yeah. Yeah. G girl out there with her, her legends card just flying, you know, so it's, oh, cool. it's, uh, you know, very wide variety of people. And, you know, it's a little bit weird because, you know, I'm kind of blessed. I don't get to see a lot of the very fast California cars that you guys are used to seeing, you know, that are, you know, live out on the West coast. And for that thing to make it all the way out to Arkansas is pretty awesome. So it's a kind, it's a nice in-between place. I mean, it's a haul, you know, for anybody, but you know, you can get there from here. You know, Steve, who runs the ECTA now is responsible for me getting in the two club in uh, Lake Gardner, Australia. He shipped really? Jack Rogers 68 Camaro down there and me and Keith both drove it and both set records and got in the two club there because years earlier we had shipped our own car to Australia and the event rained out and we shipped it back. So that was like oh. a $25,000. Eh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, awesome. that is tough, David. So but, go ahead. No, you, well, I was, I was going to ask, you know, so, um, we talk about the other types of racing that Al and I do, you know, we drag race, we autocross, we do some track days here and there. Um, we started off in karting, you know, what, you know, what are your experiences? And I mean, do you have aspirations to do something else or, cause you said you're not good at other things, but there must be some things that, you know, you're, you're kind of thinking about or always want to go back and try again some, some more. I think you only ever get good at any kind of racing with seat time and experience. And that's the thing in my life as a magazine editor and TV guy, I only get to dip my foot in, get a taste of something, maybe get three laps in and then get out. So that's why I say I'm not really good at any of this. If mm. there's any discipline that I'm probably okay at, it's autocross, not so much a big track. And it's just, it's seat time, you can't get there. If I could snap my fingers and say, what's the one skill I'd love to have on earth, it would be being Randy Popst, like being able to get into any car on any road course and lay down a track time in the thing and be safe. You know, yeah. I think that's an awesome skill. Yeah, we love watching him, you know, and the wide variety of car, you know, you can kind of tell by, you know, the cars he drives, you know, the times he runs, he drives all the factory stuff for Motor Trend, mm -hmm. you know, so you can really kind of gauge a lot about the different, you know, machinery he drives, you know, just by knowing that he's got his skill and his capability. Yeah. Sure. David, you're wearing an Engine Master shirt. Let's talk about Engine Masters. Another, you know, another awesome thing that you put together and uh, over the years. So I grew up in Cincinnati and somebody who won Engine Masters multiple times, Tony Bischoff at Bischoff Engine Service. Yes. Killer. Amazing. I mean, he is just the epitome of somebody who's just ingenious at, at looking at the rule book and saying, well, I can do this. It doesn't say yeah. I can't. And uh, he's done some amazing things over the years. Engine Masters, how did it come about? And uh, what were some of the highlights from that for you? Well, Engine Masters actually started at Popular Hot Rodding Magazine before all of the magazines had sort of joined together. I was the editor of CarCraft at the time and honestly was like, oh, why didn't I think of this? Um, and they had a big success with that. And then when all the publishing companies merged and ultimately there was no popular hot rodding anymore, it got absorbed into hot rod. And the Engine Masters Challenge, for those of you who are unaware, is actually a dyno race. A bunch of builders would bring engines in different categories, put them on the dyno, and they would win by getting the best average horsepower and torque over whatever the set RPM range was for the rules that year. So that was Engine Masters the event, which unfortunately no longer happens. But a spinoff of that is Engine Masters the TV show, which I do with uh, myself, Steve Brule and Steve Dulcich out at West Tech Performance Group in Mariloma, California. And on every single episode, we do A-B testing of stuff. As a matter of fact, if you go on the Motor Trend app, there's a new episode today, which is how much compression ratio can you run on pump gas and what's really the difference in power between nine and a half to one and 11 and a quarter to one, which is like the range of what you would run on 91 octane out here in California. And so we just explore topics like that and have a lot of fun with it. And the Engine Master's name continues. So I was working with Dulce John Pistons and everything like going back into the early 2000s. And for me doing, you know, Pistons at that time, you know, it was amazing to see the wide variety of engines coming in there, all different styles. But then, you know, he was r running the rule set for a long time. Yeah. And like the way that he was coming up with his factors, it's like, how is this possibly going to work? And then you see a Oldsmobile, you know, go out there and compete with a Ford and a Chevy, you know, across all these crazy platforms and actually do 
you know, very close. And so, you know, the work he did there with the factors was pretty amazing to me. You actually bring up what I neglected to mention, which was that Engine Masters was also a magazine for a long time on its own oh, and yeah. uh, edited by Steve Dulcich, who's my co-host on the show and also on the Roadkill Garage show. Hmm. So David, out of the Engine Masters um, episodes that you've done, any any that stick out to you that you say, that is probably the neatest episode or the most interesting one or had the, the greatest content in it? Uh, there's some that I would put in that category because we tested age old theories and either busted them or proved them. And there's others that are just radical fun. So on the theory side of things, we finally tested long connecting rods versus short connecting rods with all else being equal except for the piston compression height. So it's the old rod ratio theory. And people talk on the internet about how that's like the single biggest thing you need to do is get the longest rod in the engine that you can and build the whole rest of the thing around that. Well, we found that for the street strip engines that most of us deal with, it really just doesn't matter. And so that was a good one. And as far as fun, we did the engine that makes the most horsepower of anything I've ever assembled myself, which is a big block Chevy that made 1500 with a blower shop, 871 and nitrous on top of it and E85. And so that was just a lot of fun. Yeah, that was awesome. I love that one, David. That was a, uh, that was a great build. When I saw that, I went, I think all of us need that. So. Yeah. And at the same Thanks. time, you know, you're happy to pull a 440 out of a, you know, an RV and, you know, go have yeah. fun with it, you know, put a cam in it and put some heads on it and go with Bill it. Bill Sitch said that to me yesterday. He's like, why are we super excited about this engine making 1400 horsepower? Just as excited as we are when this one makes 16 or 1500 horsepower. And it's because right. it's all technical stuff. And you realize for this package of parts, we just put together for this goal, we did good. And so it really doesn't matter if it's making 300 or 1800, it's all interesting tech. So here's another one with that. I'm gonna keep on going with engines here because it's obviously a great love for, for you and really for all of us. But um, so the technology to hold you know, an engine together, uh, EFI kind of being something in self-learning EFI, uh, you know, some of the, you know, the Holly systems and some of the, you know, the you know, really big stuff, three, I think kind of really started a yeah. lot of that stuff. Fuel tech. Well, yeah. that's so much Excel stuff before there, that. What, what's that? John Meany was John Meany was with Excel before big stuff even. That was way back in the early 90s. It, oh, yeah, exactly. dude, I, I was the DFI product guy back in the oh, that's uh, right. mid to late 90s. Yeah, that's how I bought Old Red, the Camaro that I still have from I remember this. on the Hot Rod TV set when Chuck Hansen was the guy down there. Yeah. And I uh, bought the car from the set because we went to do a fuel injection installation. So yeah, John, John is a good friend. He's been around for, for a long time and uh, still doing well and still running big stuff. So yeah, he's uh, really an incredible guy. I see Mary Beth Sullivan, Excel was right here in Ohio. The distribution and the product management was Mary Beth, but the actual development of product was in Wixom, Michigan, which was where DFI's base was at. So I would travel up to Wixom every couple of weeks and we'd talk about different ECUs that we had in process and all these different things. And I uh, you know, again, John Meany, he's definitely that father of fuel injection for the aftermarket. That that guy is brilliant. Very smart and guy. Help me on my history on that. DFI was prior to Excel, and then Mr. Gasket that owned Excel bought out Meany, and DFI became Excel? Yes, that's exactly okay. right, David. Yep, that is Good the memory. exact history. And then John went on to do, I mean, geez, he did fast fuel injection after that. Yep. And then did consulting work for a number of different companies and then did big stuff three and he's still doing the big stuff three. And, you know, the new ECU that he has is just absolutely amazing. And, you know, and the key thing, Brian, I think you said is there are so many options out there now between fuel tech, Holly, fast, um, John, John stuff with big stuff three. I mean, it is unbelievable how much great technology there is. That's, that's reasonably affordable when you look at what you're getting. I mean, some of those ECUs have way more processing power than than what powered the Saturn V rocket originally. And it's uh, unbelievable. And it helps people keep their engines together. That yeah. Huge power with stock blocks. You know, I, I think about, you know, what I see with people doing testing, you know, on, on stock block, you know, Richard Holdner, for instance, you know, doing this stuff where he pops two big, you know, turbos on the thing and he goes make 1500 with a stock block. Yeah. So stock block racing is now a thing. And I have to say that a lot of that is probably because of the the EFI systems out there now and all the safeties that they've got on them. Obviously, you know, you see the speeds the cars are attaining. So like getting the car down track, their ability to meter power by gear, power by speed, power by whatever, uh, by how much the, the front end is hanging off the ground. So it's, yeah. it's pretty amazing. 
hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. Traction management. It's funny. We've, we've joked a lot, David, about, you know, any more, and especially this is with the no prep stuff. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Cause I'm fascinated by that and the growth in that, but you know, the no prep racing, making power and somebody on the commentary said, call Steve Petty. You aren't kidding. You talk about a, uh, an organization and Steve himself that can make incredible power without blowing stuff up, making power anymore really is not necessarily the problem. Although it's, you know, speed costs money and all that good stuff, but it's traction management. You know, how in the world do you get down the track with something making 3000 horsepower? And that's, you know, that, that is not out of the question anymore. Some of the power those guys are putting down, it is absolutely insane how fast, especially the small tire leaf spring guys go that that's one part of the no prep or limited prep stuff that just amazes me how fast those guys go. So that technology development and traction control has absolutely been what's been vital to those guys doing what they're doing. And what's really interesting is to see how that has created the progression of what's really popular in like the street style of drag racing. Cause in the nineties was fastest street car racing pro street was the thing. And then we had a 10 inch tire deal and that was out of control. So everyone loved it, but then people figured that out. So it wasn't good enough. So they went to radials and then those cars were out of control, but then they figured it out and it was too hooked up. Then we went to the eight inch slick, which was a little bit of a blip out here in California anyway. And that was out of control, but people figured that out. And so then they went to no prep. It's like, What's next? We just keep stepping down that traction factor and stepping up the speed. It's wild. Yeah. yeah. And we'll Millie bars on <laughs> sand eventually, you know. And nobody yeah. runs, we yeah. I mean, everybody in like nineteen eighty five had wheelie bars on their cars. And now it's like a sign of shame if you got wheelie bars right. on your cars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's you know, funny. It's like a yeah. fourteen second car had wheelie bars out here. So I don't know about that. So how does that translate? So you drive a very powerful car uh on salt at well over 200 miles an hour. And that's a lot like kind of trying to drive on a dirt road. So tell us a little bit about your experience with that because that, that's not easy either. So in two of the land speed racing venues that we do, it's not concrete. Out of here at El Mirage, it's dirt. And I've been 190 plus backwards there twice because of traction. And uh, I set my record at 208.791 miles an hour on the dirt. At Bonneville, the surface, I think a lot of people don't really understand it. It is hard packed salt. You walk up, you wipe it off the ground, you taste it, it is salt. And some years it has a lot of traction. You can actually do a burnout on it and leave marks. Other years, it's kind of mushy. Sometimes it's loose. Often there's waves in the track, so it's not smooth and flat. And I've gone 261 miles an hour there. People always ask me about that because it's unlike any other type of racing. We actually add weight to the car for traction. Right. You want to add weight with a wing on the back with aerodynamics if you can, but some classes don't allow that. Our car weighs 5,000 pounds. And people are like, how can you go that fast? It's because you're not overcoming inertia. You're dealing with the traction and aerodynamic problem. So it's really different than anything else I'm aware of. So with that, you know, Tell us about your time. Have you spent a lot of time in like the A2 wind tunnel? And, and you know, you, you must have an interest in that if you know, if you're a friend of key. We did specifically take our car to the A2 wind tunnel and it's a big part of the reason why we're successful. Remember with aerodynamics, the thing is if you have a car with a fixed aerodynamic package and it say tops out at a hundred miles an hour, just theoretically, in order to make it go 200 miles an hour, you need eight times the amount of horsepower. So, you know, it's exponential. So horsepower isn't the chase. Aerodynamics is the big deal. So if you can solve your aerodynamics, you'll go way faster than if you add another 50 horsepower. So right. we went to A2 and we did a lot of stuff in the wind tunnel with cardboard and masking tape to judge the shape of the car within the rules. And we figured out how to make it pretty fast. And there now are subsequently rules in the SCTA rule book that we own as our own because some of the stuff we learned and did have subsequently become illegal. <laughs> so <laughs> That's the best. Yeah. That's awesome. So David, Jeff Long asked the question, will they allow spikes in the tires? And we'll talk about ice racing in a minute because that's relative to that. But uh, will they do that? I don't think so, right? Uh, you know, it's interesting if I read the book really carefully, I'm not sure it specifically says that you can't do that, but there is a rule that you can't run a solid tire without specific permission. And I think 
I've never seen anybody run spikes and I'm sure if you showed up with it, they would not allow it. And I'm not sure you would really want them in the tire going that fast. Way, One yeah. of the things about land speed racing is that you're dealing with the centrifugal force of the tread area of the tire. Goodyear and Mickey Thompson both make a land speed racing tire. As a matter of fact, Summit had the last two Goodyears in stock anywhere when I bought them just a couple months ago for our car. So it looks like a drag racing front runner, but it has a much tighter cord structure so that it doesn't grow when you're going, you know, with some people up to 400 miles an hour. Awesome. Well, hey, shout out to our supply chain group for having those tires, David. That's a good job team. Way to go guys and yep. girls. So that's awesome. So David, ice racing, you ever have any interest? Have you ever watched any of the videos about the crazy folks that are up in like Minnesota that go, quarter mile or maybe it's eighth mile, but they basically drag race on ice. I'm fascinated by that. I want to do it. I have been to the Merrill, Wisconsin ice drags, which happens on a frozen river up there. Um, that is spikes. What they actually do is put drywall screws, like thousands of them through their tires. And that's pretty nuts. I've also always wanted to do the R Gang Off-Road Club uh, four-wheel drive autocross racing on frozen lakes in Colorado. Oh, nice. yeah, that would be a riot. And in New York, they do wheel-to-wheel -wheel road racing on big frozen lakes. So, yeah, there's a lot of this. Wheel-to-wheel <laughs> -wheel road racing on yes. frozen? Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> so uh, how about hill climbs? Since we're on the subject, Pike Speak, that type of stuff. Uh, yeah, I have been to Gravel Rama in Cleves, Ohio, when I was the editor of Four Wheel and Off Road magazine, and that is wild too. The amount of horsepower people put into these giant paddles to climb a big hill, it's pretty wild. I've never driven that one myself. Hmm, got it. That's uh, ironically, David. That's funny. I don't know when you were there if Tony Bischoff was running the the buggy that he had. But oh, that I don't actually know. is he started doing. I think he started his engine building business because. He did that. He was a gravel Rama competitor. And uh, I remember a friend of mine when he first showed up, at least my memory of him first showing up at Edgewater, some of his guys was, oh man, he he's dominated at gravel Rama. He's got like basically a comp eliminator, small block Chevy that he leaves at like 9,500 and shifts it yeah. to or something insane. And, and I was like, really? And then as I got to know him better over the years, I'm like, yeah, he's the real deal. They're uh they absolutely know what they're doing. And Tony's just an engine genius. I mean, I, I'll just say that he's brilliant. I first came to know of Tony Bischoff in the very early days of Hot Rod Magazine's fastest streetcar shootouts on those small tire cars that I was talking about. In particular, there was a guy named Gary Rowe who had a, a little light blue Fox notch that was winning class every single time. And he worked for Bischoff and Bischoff had engines in other cars. And, and that's how I came to know him. So that's way back 1993, four five, something like that. Oh yeah, David, I'll tell you a really funny, quick Gary Rose story. So I raced at Edgewater and knew, knew those guys. We knew Gary was building a car. He shows up at Edgewater in the baby blue Mustang, little tires on it. And we're all sitting there looking at the car and, and Tony's with him. And one of the guys we're with goes, oh, it's a Ford. It isn't going to run. And he goes, oh, okay, we'll see. They go out, and I think the first hit off the trailer was like a 1070 or something like that. They come back around, and, and Tony was always a pretty quiet guy. But he looks at all of us, and he goes, that one's pretty good for a Ford, huh? And we're like, yeah, that car's fast. And he goes, yeah, we're going to spray it in a little bit. We're like, what, what do you mean you're going to spray it? And he goes, yeah, it was all motor. And he just laughed, and Gary laughed. And, and I, if my memory's right, by the end of the night, and they still weren't happy with how the car ran. They went nines. I think they went like 980s, 990s, something like that. And, and it was just that car back then, to your point, had little tires on it. It was baby blue. And that that was when all of us that were, you know, Chevy's. folks that, yeah, Chevy guys went, wow, that car is really, really fast. So very, very funny story. But Gary Rowe, he's been doing it forever, still doing chassis and stuff in Cincinnati. And and uh, yeah, we got to know him well. Gary's a great guy and uh, super smart, but he was such a fixture in all the NMCA stuff over the years. And that car was amazing to watch the progression of it. But yeah, I still remember when that car, Baby Blue, I think they even had like those chrome like wagon wheels on the front of it or something. It was just, <laughs> you'd look at the car and go, there's no way that car's fast. And then they roll it off the trail and go rip off a time like that. And we're all like, holy smokes, does that car run? Yep. So that, that was pretty awesome. One of my greatest cover blurbs ever as a, car, as a magazine editor on CarCraft, I did Gary Rowe, cheating SOB with a question mark. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. That's awesome. It's just a creative interpretation of the rules, right, David? That's all it is, you know? Yep. 
good times back then for sure. So we talked a little bit, we've talked about a lot of racing here and the evolution, and we're getting a lot of questions like, basically what is, where do you see the future of hot riding go? I mean, it, it's always evolving, it's never gonna stop, but where do you see it going? Ah, uh, wow, you know, that's one of the biggest things that people ask me, and I guess I never have the awesome answer to it, possibly because I'm trying to like look away from the whole electric car thing, which is obviously coming down the road. Yep. I think that's gonna be niche for quite a long time though. Uh, the thing I've always said is that car guys don't want to just go fast. They want to go fast in the car that they love. So even if Tesla comes out with an eight second car off the showroom floor, there's going to be people that don't care and don't want to drive it because they want their 55 Chevy with a big block in it and a tunnel ram to be fast. That's right. And I think that the guys that want that have started to age out but there is a generation of 30 somethings right now who are leading a nostalgia wave for that kind of thing. There's the entire, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Southeast Gassers Association thing that's going on that's huge right. and, and neat. Oh um, yeah, they're a good partner of ours, David. Great group of folks. There you go. Um, but clearly the whole modern thing is turbo LS swaps into random cars that are way cheaper to buy than anything that's in the muscle car world right now. Right. Yeah. Matt Happel from Sloppy Mechanics is a good friend of ours as well. And, yep, 100%. you know, that's it's it's kind of a funny thing there, you know, because Sloppy Mechanics is not stupid mechanics. And that's something I see that comment every once in a while. There are some brilliant people over there that are learning how to go very, very fast with very, very little. Uh, and, you know, us in part sale, people are like, oh, you know, shouldn't everybody have, you know, the most expensive stuff? It's like, no, just go fast with what you've got. And then eventually you're going to want to go faster. Yeah, so I, I think that, you know, going onto those forums and if you ask a question, the people have been through it. Uh, you can find guys over there that are gurus, that are well-respected, that, you know, take the time to share their knowledge. Uh, you know, those Facebook user groups really are, you know, what the forums, you know, used to be, you know, and we're big fans of LS1 Tech and others. And that's one thing, you know, those places are great repositories of knowledge. And that's something where a, a sloppy mechanic question, unfortunately, you can you know, there's no place to necessarily keep it. There are some places, but, you know, it's one nice thing, you know, to go back to an old school forum, do a search, it's there, you can find it, you know, versus having, you know, 13 guys like, you know, how much, you know, you know, horsepower can I get on my, you know, L69 injectors or whatever. Yeah, yeah no those doubt. are the right guys. I've always said, you have to know how to do it right in order to know what you can get away with when you're doing it wrong. And uh, then add on top of that, the experience that those guys have with making Junkyard LS short blocks go fast. And uh, it's the place to go for sure. Yeah, it's been a big specialty here, not to toot our own horn, but our team over here at Summit Racing with our Pro LS brand, you see me wearing the shirt and I got the hat and all that business, but it's, it's been the best part of it. You know, it's, it's, you know, coming out with some really great, you know, pistons and rods, cranks, you know, the cams. And it's, it's kind of cool because we, we keep the stuff priced pretty reasonably as well, especially for what it is and how well it performs. Uh, and people appreciate that about us. And it's just, it's never ending. You know, there's more stuff that we want to come out with all the time. So uh, it's been a big business for us. And, you know, it's hard for a lot of people, you know, that are watching our program today. It's like LS, 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 you know, it's like, well, I, I know, but you know, it's, it's easy to go very fast with it. And to your point about nostalgia, uh, I worked at Detroit speed with, you know, folks there for a, for a hot minute, you know, a few years back and we get people like, yeah, I'm putting an LS in my 69 Camaro. Cool. Putting an LS in my 69 Camaro. Cool. Uh, I got a 355 with a four speed that's cool. Okay. You know, the guy <laughs> trying to go fast with, with, you know, what you and I, you know, remembers, you know, if you were making 375 at the wheel 420 crank or something, you were really making something back then. It's crazy that a small block Chevy has become retro cool. Yeah. But if you look at, at, at the cycle of hot engines over the hot rodding years, that's what happens. Like, you might not even be aware, Chevy four cylinders were the thing before the Ford flathead V8. Everybody hated yeah. them because everybody used them. Then the flathead came out and everybody hated them because everybody used them. And then there was a, a group of like the Oldsmobile and the Hemi the and people. that came out. And then the small block Chevy. And then everybody hated the small block Chevy, but I, that's just how it goes. And right now the LS is the new thing and the small block used to be 
the thing everybody loved to hate, but now it's retro. Yeah, and especially when you see one that's a 355 instead of a 383 or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. it's just, yeah. you know, it's just, you know, what I grew up with. Well, I'll tell you, we you know, just did a 327 on Engine Masters and made 550 horsepower with it, and it ran to 8,000 RPM, and it was amazing. We're like, this is cool. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's awesome. Especially when you're putting it behind a four speed or something like that. Right. You like to bang gears, right? Yep. So you're just letting the thing fly. You've got a recent video you did with, with a fairly small cubic inch deal that, you know, you were letting the thing fly too. I don't remember what you might be referring to. You know, a lot of people do that. They'll say, oh, I saw this show. And I'm like, what? It's like, oh, I did that eight years ago. And you just saw it on TV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's out of my exactly. mind. So, yeah. yeah. David, you know, one other engine platform, aside from the Turbo LS stuff that we're seeing really coming on pretty strong, late model Hemi stuff. Yeah. Yep. Late model Hemi stuff. The cylinder head is really excellent. Um, actually, I mentioned Tony Bischoff earlier. He won Engine Masters I, more than once, if my memory's right. Oh, yeah. He's the late model Hemi platform. And, uh, you know, in the factory stock NHRA class, mm -hmm. you know, the Hemis are running right there, if not better than the Copos and the Cobra Jet Mustangs and well, everything else. Jeff Kirk's Challenger was the very first one of those in the sevens and obviously Gen 3 Hemi powered. Yeah, isn't that Blackbird? Is that what he calls that car? If yes. I remember right. Yeah, yeah, that car's fast. He's he's a sharp guy. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. But yeah, we're seeing you know more and more of the Hemis, and I I, I got to give Dodge a lot of credit. I think their marketing program and what they did with that vehicle. I mean, it, it seems like you know five years ago you'd look around and there would be like a Hellcat here and maybe another one there. They're everywhere now. And they keep making the millions. same car for a decade now, and it, it's making it real easy. You know, my son, you know, he's he's turning eighteen, and you know, he that's what he wants. He wants a Challenger, you know. And there's so many of those cars on the road. Uh, I've had people that. When those cars were first coming out, they're like, I'm going to buy one. I'm going to get my useful life out of it on the street. And then I'm going to turn it into a race car because they could just see what the future was. But, you know, there's so many of those engines and trucks. Holly's got all of their uh, Hemi swap stuff out. So everything like they did for, you know, putting an LS into everything, they've done uh, that program with theirs with the Dakota. Uh, so I, I think it's just brilliant. It's a way to keep people going really fast without like a high you know, barrier to entry, you know, when it comes to finding, you know, stuff in a junkyard yet. I think it's really telling that what you're seeing with Holly on the Gen 3 swap thing is not so much the muscle car era. It is Dakotas and trucks. Yeah. They see that as the biggest market segment. And I do too, because I actually got in an argument with them a little bit when they first started to do that program. I'm like, Mopar muscle car guys do not swap Gen 3 Hemis into their original 446 pack car or super B or whatever. And they're like, you're right, but they do put them in Dakotas and trucks and there's <laughs> enough of the muscle car guys doing it that it's worth it. And that's, they've right. been right. And I was wrong. That's great. And they just keep on, on making those engines too. So, you know, we yep. just, and you know, we appreciate that. You know, those guys are pushing, you know, really harder than probably, I hate to say this, but anybody in the big three, you know, they they have the demon, which is the pinnacle right now in terms of, you know, power, you know, and, and things, you know, lunch control, you know, just, they did it, you know, so hats off to those guys in engineering over there and, you know, product and marketing that are, you know, pushing everything, obviously, you know, great job guys at Ford and, and Chevy too, but, you know, I got to say that the Hellcats, you know, they're putting it, it's more of an everyman vehicle, you know, than it's yeah, the L1, with, for instance, or a GT500. With Dodge, I think it's a top-down thing. Tim Kaniscus has been the guy in charge of Dodge for a long time and he's a wild man and he loves muscle cars and he is just making that stuff happen. I remember when he pulled me behind the Mopar booth at SEMA, I couldn't tell you what year, it was many years ago, I was like, what would you think if we made a factory car with a trans brake? I was like, are you kidding? And that became the demon. That guy just makes that stuff happen. It's pretty cool. Right. Well, David, and if actually, you ever talk to Let him. me do a quick plug here, promotional yeah. plug. We just announced that that Roadkill Nights event, which is boarded by Dodge, is uh, happening again. That's where we shut down Woodward Avenue in Pontiac, Michigan, and actually have legal street racing. It's going to be August 14th. Nice. August 14th. Awesome. That is yeah. great. We'll have to get up to that for sure. Well, and speaking of plugs, you know, who else do you want to talk about, you know, while, while you're, you know, hanging out? Well, I'm always obligated to try and take care of, you know, where my bread and butter comes from, the Motor Trend app. You can subscribe to it and see Roadkill, Roadkill Garage, Engine Masters, Hot Rod Garage, Dirt Every Day, plus everything that you see on uh, Motor Trend Cable TV, plus some of the stuff that you see on Discovery TV that's car related. The nice. Motor Trend app is basically like Netflix, but with nothing but car content. Love it. That's awesome. So David, Kyle Duffy has another great question. I love this one. If you could time travel, 
what would one thing be that you would do differently? I would love to go back to my whole career, starting with when I first started at the parts counter at a Dodge dealership and relive it exactly how it was, knowing what I know now. And the reason for that is I've had so many opportunities that got past me or so many people who I kind of knew who I would love to know more from so that I could pick their brain. I've been super fortunate to have a ton of opportunities and I didn't exploit them all the way I wish that I had. Yeah. My guess is being uh, being a Dodge parts guy, you probably would have bought out every Hemi block that was on the planet. Um, you know, <laughs> those were gone. Then the one thing that I got that was still in stock, which was I'll say it was the last one in the country, but who knows? It was one of the last ones I could get my hands on was a six pack air cleaner lid that I bought brand new when I was working at the Dodge dealership in 85. <laughs> nice. Wow. Yeah, that is awesome. So David, out of all the engine master stuff, kind of getting back to that a little bit, what engine was your least favorite? Which one, <clears throat> which one did you just want to pin it at Watt and blow the thing up and put it out of its misery? Um, I get frustrated every single time we end up with some problem that means that the story isn't going in a straight line. So I, I do get frustrated with that show quite a bit. We break little tiny things that put us behind in our schedule and it's stuff we never show on camera because it's kind of irrelevant like we broke the servo on the dyno this week um it's little things like that that are more frustrating than the engine itself we did have one motor that steve brule called the worst thing he's ever tested in his 25 year history of dyno testing motors over there and it was a junkyard 360 chrysler and it had no rings left in it. No matter what parts you threw at it, it was not going to make more power. <laughs> so <laughs> that thing was a turn. That's awesome. That's awesome. And shout out to Steve too, David. Yeah. You mentioned him. And Brian and I have talked about people we've learned from over the years and all the editorial that's been done in that facility. And Steve is, yeah. you know, you, you maybe you should give him like the title Chief Engine Master or something like that because he Absolutely. is uh, amazing. Absolutely an amazing fellow. So Glad yeah, he has more practical hands-on experience with engines than virtually anybody because he tests them every single day. Yep. Nice. So what other kind of racing, David, is there anything else on your bucket list when you look around and say, I'm going to get to that, I'm going to do that, um, you know, ice road racing, any, any of that kind of stuff? Or are you kind of like, you want to try everything, try it all? You know, I think that my passion that way always turns into cars that I want to build. And I guess that's good for what we do on Roadkill because I get to actually build them. Like we just did the Hemi Gremmy, which is a AMC Gremlin with a 426 Hemi in it. And I just had that vision forever. I'm going to build a street freak like they did in the 70s with a tunnel ram way out of the hood. And, you know, the valve cover sticking out of the hood. And it's going to look like an Ed Roth drawing. And we did it. And yeah, unfortunately, awesome. that means, oh, cool, I got that out of my system. Now what's next? <laughs> yeah. And so the what's next is I have always wanted to build. Sometimes I'll come up with a vehicle name and then have to build around it, which is the Dragoneer. I want to build a Jeep Wagoneer that is a street strip car. Uh, like put a blonde big block Chevy or Turbo LS in the thing and try and make it the perfect drag week vehicle where you can fit all your stuff in the back and then go blast like 850s with this ridiculous big I, SUV. I, I had a 76, awesome. I had a 76 Cherokee over yeah, here, yeah. Uh, you know, for a little while, it was only maybe 10 or 12 something years ago, but I could not keep the thing running. It wanted to die. It wanted to die. It became like, you know, like Moby Dick. It was like the whale, right? It was like, you know, Captain Ahab. It was everything that was, could ever go wrong. You know, fuel system block Chevy problems, fixes distributor that. gears, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, you work at a place that sells swap parts, you know? Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But I just, you know, and it would leave me on the side of the road uh, all the time. And it took me back to my youth of when I also, you know, broke down all the time, 16, 17, 18 years old. You know, so there was that thing. It's like, I'm not going to let this thing beat me. And yet it kept beating me and beating me and beating me. So if you want to find yourself a 76 Cherokee, that's the two-door one. It's very, very cool. It's got, you know, kind of like the the cool uh, graffiti stuff down the side of that. And then yep. you want to completely rip that thing apart. I'd really support that. Okay. Yeah. Brian, your car was telling you, you should have just thrown a brick on the gas pedal and to David's <laughs> point, throw nuts in the carburetor and then put a big block in it. Uh, it it's funny. <laughs> so, so we actually have a good photo of it. Uh, I'll, I'll dig it up sometime. 
but it had a two barrel 360 on it. So again, getting back to the 360 there and, and the thing was constantly getting filled up with, you know, fuel and gunk in the carb. So it would make 145 horsepower. We disconnected the front drive shaft to it. I uh, uh, called up Bill Titchener over there and he's like, you need a Holly street demon with a phenolic bowl. And then I got like an air gap intake thing immediately popped 185 to the wheels thing immediately pulled another 1500 RPM. And it's like, okay, life is good. And that's that's <laughs> yep. about as far as I got with it. It's those little victories that keep me going. I mean, back to my conversation about 300 horsepower can be as exciting as 1500. Right. It's just tinkering with stuff and making it better. I don't yeah. care if it's a 76 Cherokee with a 360 AMC motor. It's fun. Yeah, very true. Awesome. David, Jesse Hayes asks a question. Baja 1000 with a question mark. Is that on your bucket list? Is that anywhere on your radar? I used to have a desire to do that. I did a pre-run with Rod Hall one time, which was one of my greatest experiences. Rod Hall won the first Baja 1000 overall and is the winningest Baja racer of all time. He passed away, uh, I'm going to say mid last year or early last year, which was a tragedy. Um, that experience was awesome. I wanted to run Baja in class 11, which is stock VW. But wow. it was the only class I could afford, but it's also the single most abusive thing you can do to your body. It's like <laughs> driving in a paint shaker for a thousand miles. So <laughs> I don't think I'm right. ultimately going to do it, but it was a dream at one time. Now, stock Volkswagen, is that air cold only or can you run in late model stuff? So air cold. <laughs> yep. And, air -cold and when you stuff. say stock, you don't mean stock like no wheels, tires, you're, you're lifted. They uh, cut and turn the axles. They take stock suspension components and weld them up so they don't break. Um, because they are, are turning the torsion bars and stuff, they get them up to a bigger ride height and they run off-road tires on them. But they are stock wheels, stock engine, stock body, everything but safety equipment and beefing things up. Wow. Yeah. Wow, you are a glutton for punishment. That would be it's awesome. Nuts. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's crazy. So another one is you're talking about the rots and which is actually, I had two of those growing up. I had a 73 240Z and then an early 74 240Z. Those cars got away from me a long time. Everything rusts. And I just bought another one. The thing's coming home. It's got a 4G63 in it. Al's telling me again, you know, like focus, Brian, focus, focus. You do not <laughs> want this thing in your life. And I'm stuck with this Datsun Z thing that I've had since my youth. Uh, is that thing still around at all? The, the roadkill Rotson? Yeah, yeah. It is. As a matter of fact, uh, they just made a very short run of Hot Wheels of the Rotson, both when we got it and then after we put it uh, with the five liter motor with the turbo on it. So that's very cool. That car is a pile, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. Has a lot of really good image. That's awesome. Cool, David, cool. do you have any projects that, or cars, I should say, not even projects, but cars that you're never going to get rid of? Probably your Super B, I'm going to guess, is one. Yes, thank you for knowing that. Uh, I'm in a problem spot right now where I have so many cars I can't get rid of that I don't know how to buy more cars because I can't expand the fleet. I'm out of storage by a long shot. My <laughs> lifetime total of most cars owned at the same time is 41, and I'm now down to 21. And of those, you know, I can't get rid of my Super B, the Crusher Camaro, uh, the F-Bomb Camaro, um, the Disgusting, which is a 69 Mach 1, uh, the crop duster, which is a 70 duster we just finished painting. There's so many that are all of a sudden coming together that I have to get rid of some other gems in order to gather more. And I always want more. So. Yeah. Hey, speaking of the crusher, you had a thing you threw out uh, maybe a week ago about, so what should I do with the crusher next? Where do I go? When are we doing drag week? I probably would never do drag week with that car because I think it just has too much heritage. It's too valuable. I don't want to drive it in the rain. I don't want to get it smashed. And I know that's yeah. the wrong answer. It'd just be go, go, go. No, Everybody asks me when I'm going to do drag week. And the thing is, I love announcing the live feed with Brian Loans, who's the NHRA announcer and a longtime friend. And we just, we laugh so hard. We kill each other all week long. And I love doing that, which is why I haven't raced the thing yet. So if I ever do it, it'll probably be Rocky Mountain Race Week, which is another Dragon Drive event. And I want to do it either with the Dragoneer that I haven't built yet or with the Crusher Impala, which is a 1969 Impala that is an absolute beater. But it's got a 871 blown big block in it. And if I caged that thing up and threw my 1500 horse motor in it, I could probably get some weight out of it and make it run 850 and do that with that car. Wow. 
That's yeah. awesome. Hey, and you mentioned Brian Lone. So Brian, we're uh, going to coordinate one of these sessions with him in the very near future, because like you said, a uh, great guy, great friend of the industry, phenomenal NHRA announcer. I mean, Brian is just absolutely top shelf and, and a huge asset to the NHRA. So it's uh, funny you mentioned that. And you two together on that, David, I've listened to some of those uh, pieces you guys have done. Just hilarious. I mean, it, it's, you know, awesome. You guys are a great combination for that. Thank you. We do it for our own entertainment more than anything. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's great. I've been fortunate enough with Brian to be able to go on NHRA on Fox a couple of times. And it's hard for me not to just go into that drag week mode and start busting chops and making fun of people. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's very cool. And yes, Brian's the ultimate pro. Yeah, right absolutely. On. So from all the people that you've met, David, when you think back over, you know, many years of, of doing all this crazy stuff, who stands out in your mind as somebody you met that you'd say, you know, here, here's my top three, top five, just amazing, incredible, interesting folks that you've met and had, had the pleasure to get to know? I, again, through all my magazine stuff, I'm sort of the last gener generation that overlapped with the pioneers. And I've been super lucky to meet people like Robert E. Peterson, who founded Hot Rod and Motor Trend. Wally Parks was huge, the first mm -hmm. editor of Hot Rod, founder of the NHRA. Uh, Ray Brock, who was incredibly influential as a Hot Rod Magazine uh, staffer at the time. Uh, I mean, I can go down the list. I just made a post the other day about famed Mopar drag racer Dick Landy, who was a mentor of mine who I miss very much. Gray yeah. Baskerville from Hot Rod was a massive influence on me, who died way too young in 2001 at about 65 years old. Mm. There's There's way too many to pick one. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Hard question to answer. And I... Uh... Our industry is so awesome because I I met Ed, Ed Iskandarian a few years ago. I don't remember if it was SEMA or PRI, but talk about a nice, genuine, humble person. You know, a friend of mine introduced me to him and I go, you're 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 the Ed Iskandarian? And he goes, well, there's probably more than one, but I, I guess I'm one of them. You know, and he yeah. just laughed and, yeah. you know, and, and I began asking him all these probably stupid questions about camshaft stuff, but what what a nice genuine yeah. just awesome and person he just and turned so 100. Like, yeah isn't that amazing i mean at, the, at yeah. that time he was in his like late 90s and i remember asking i go it's it's like your myth i'm like no there's no way he can be this old david's 73 ed's you know <laughs> right. 90 something. but but it was just such a cool uh conversation and, and we're just blessed our industry's got tons of great car people in it that are awesome to talk to fun to fun to ask and, and when you meet these people it's really funny they they're like, oh yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Ed. You know, what what, what do you want to talk about camshafts? I mean, just just yep. uh, just like every every other person, you know. Rock and roll. Yep, Vic Edelbrock, same way. Another one gone. Oh yeah, David. Talk. Yeah, no kidding. I I so every year at SEMA, you know, we would have dinners with some of our vendors, and one year the Edelbrock folks were nice enough to say, you and Vic ought to talk road racing and vintage SCCA stuff. I love the Trans Am era stuff. And he and I, the entire dinner, I mean, almost like this interview, I felt bad because I felt like I'm interviewing the poor guy and he can't eat his dinner, but it was <laughs> phenomenal. It was one of the greatest experiences that I've ever had asking. And the one question I asked him was hilarious. I said, so Vic, out of all the Trans Am cars that you own, you've got, you know, the Parnelli Jones Boss 302, you've got your Z06, you've got some incredible cars, amazing, amazing road race cars. What's your favorite? And his daughter was was down the table from us. And he goes, this is like asking me which one of my children's my favorite. I can't answer that. He goes, yeah. they're all great. You know, they're just different. And he talked about characteristics of the cars. And it was fantastic. It was such a great experience. And uh, yeah. just an amazing individual. You know, you, you'd meet him. I remember we went out to Pebble Beach one year, went to the vintage races. And Vic's out there ripping around. And a couple of friends of mine, Mike and Jeff, or lifelong friends of mine, we're all out there together, my neighbor, Steve. And uh, at the end of the, the racing, we're like, oh, let's go by the Edelbrock trailer and just say hi. And we see him, he goes, hey, come on in. You guys want a margarita? And he's got one of those yep. gas-powered blenders. And he's making margaritas for like 50 people that are all customers and fans and just the best. I mean, one of the, one of the best people and a great partner to us. And uh, we still have a great relationship with the Edelbrock company. Uh, even though Vic is no longer there and, and, uh, you know, just, just a great guy though, David. It was not, not unlike dealing with summit <laughs> is that, 
Uh, Vic, when you went into business meetings, was all business, kind of hard nose, had his facts in a row. And when you were done with that, it's like, hey, you want a beer? Yeah, everything's great. And you would just hang out like buddies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was cool. just, just, just amazing. So, David, you got any uh, any last words? We're running up on our hour here, and we know your time's valuable. You got to go make millions of pieces of content, and you got cars to build and all that kind of horsepower. stuff. Yeah, horsepower to make, engines to break, all that good stuff. Any any last things you want to share with the audience, or any things that are coming up in the future you want to make them aware of? I would say watch my social media and see if I set another record at El Mirage this weekend. Um, and then beyond mm -hmm. that, I'm going into a roadkill shoot and then a personal road trip. I've got a week off, which is unusual, but I guess uh, my uh, my whole life is worn on my sleeve on Instagram. You can find out what I'm doing almost all of the time. And I appreciate everybody who follows these things. I feel I'm so lucky to work in this industry and to know people like you and to have done the things that I'm doing and to be able to keep doing it. I honestly have the gearheads ultimate job and I'm appreciative to everybody who follows it and everybody like you guys who support it. Well said. Well, thank you, David. We appreciate the relationship, appreciate the friendship. Whenever you need parts from us, you know who to call. And I, uh, I buy tens of you. thousands of dollars every month. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you. Our families, yeah. uh, we, yeah, get, we appreciate it. Yeah. We take care of all our families, all of our employees on behalf of the entire summit team, David want to thank you for your time today. Um, you know, we let our staff know when this is coming up and I got multiple emails going, that's awesome. We can't wait to hear oh, cool. what driver's got to say. And it's so cool because, you know, we work in a company just full of enthusiasts, people at different levels that, you know, that automotive ADD thing, if you like some form of racing, there's somebody here that does it. And it, it is sure. a pleasure to come to work every day. It's a pleasure to talk to you and catch up today. So thanks. Thanks so much for your time and uh, look forward to seeing you. Hopefully we'll get up to the uh, Woodward event. And we'll see you up there. Oh, that would be amazing. Hope to. Thank you. Sounds great. Thanks, David. Have a great day. Have a great weekend and good luck this weekend. And also congratulations on breaking the uh, Granatelli record. That's phenomenal. So thank you. you will get it. You will get it. And to all of our mutual fans out there, thank you for tuning in here today. You know, we couldn't be here doing this stuff because, well, it's, it's because of you. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend.